Hey, it's Dr. Asatar Bear, and in this lecture, we're going to be talking about money. And we, we're going to be discussing here uh, three eras of monetary history. And we're going to start in this lecture with the very first one, uh, which is known as commodity money. All right, commodity money. This is the oldest uh, historical form of money. So when we talk about different historical eras of money, uh, commodity money is the oldest by far, all right? So this is thousands and thousands of years old. Uh, in fact, uh, it goes back to probably before uh, recorded history. Some of our oldest historical records uh, were financial records. So we, we know that money was being used even before things were being written down, all right? Thousands of years old. And what, what this basically means, okay, so when we say commodity money, uh, what this means is that the economic functions of money, all right, more on this on, in a second, uh, are fulfilled by a physical item, okay, a, a commodity. Uh, that is the meaning of commodity money. Now, it would be nice if we could be a little more specific, but the fact of the matter is that many different items have, have served this function, okay, have, have served as money uh, historically, all right? many different kinds of, of physical commodities, okay? Sometimes the, uh, these kinds of money are actually living, right? So we have, for example, different kinds of livestock uh, have been used as money uh, historically, okay? So we had cattle, uh, sheep, pigs, chickens, things like this, all right? So the use of cattle as money, uh, very, very old. And sometimes products associated with cattle, uh, hides, uh, you know, leather, uh, even things like dung. Um, so, you know, the very, uh, a, a large category of different items, okay? Then we also have, uh, you know, things that have been derived from that. So like I mentioned, uh, hides or furs, pelts, things like this. Sometimes things like teeth have served as money, right? So when we think back historically, these are some of the first durable items. Uh, you know, these are the most durable parts of the animal, let's say, right? The, the hide or the fur, the teeth, etc. cetera. Um, all right, so uh, we also find sometimes uh, things are used as money which are themselves perishable or consumable uh, products. So we have things like salt or spices or uh, tobacco and so forth, okay? Uh, we have uh, things that are ornamental, uh, shells or, or polished stones uh, and so forth, right? That, um, you know, again, many, many historical examples of this. Uh, sometimes tools have been used as money. Uh, we have uh, an example of this, the widespread use of the iron uh, hoe, uh, the farming implement uh, used extensively uh, as, as money in, in Africa. Um, you know, there's probably a joke in here somewhere about how hoes are money. I, I don't know. I'm too classy to make a joke like that, obviously. But uh, anyway, the, many, many different examples of different kinds of commodities uh, and, and you know many more okay but probably what happens historically you know is, is that though many of these have been used and sometimes there's more than one commodity form of money being used in a market at a given time uh, what we find is that over time the monetary metals uh, begin to uh, edge out the other forms they have certain desirable qualities 
uh, which make them more and more prominently used as, uh, in the commodity money era. And the monetary metals uh, in order of importance are the following. Okay, they're gold, silver, copper, bronze, and to a lesser extent, iron. Okay, but the, the first four certainly, all right, the monetary metals. And this means that they stand in relation to one another, right? Like that gold buys a certain amount of silver, buys a certain amount of copper, buys a certain amount of bronze, iron, etc. All right. So the, the monetary metals. All right, let's get into the economic functions of money. All right. The, so that is, what, what purpose do they fulfill in the economy? Okay, the, the first and most important of these economic functions uh, economic functions of money. Uh, the first one is the medium of exchange. Uh, medium of exchange. Uh, and sometimes this is known as the means of payment. Right? The medium of exchange or the means of payment. Um, what this means is the commodity begins to be widely accepted as a form of payment in exchange for other goods and services. All right, so widely accepted as a means of payment for goods or services. All right, that's the, the, the means of payment. The medium of exchange, okay? So the medium of exchange, it means that it facilitates facilitates exchange. It facilitates trade. Okay, so in, in terms of economic theory, um, we refer to uh, direct versus indirect exchange. Okay, so direct exchange uh, is also called barter, right? And direct exchange is where you exchange the good or service that you have for the one that you want, right? Um, so the simplest, conceptually the simplest kind of trade, right? Like, like example, okay? I have a coat and I would like to have a chicken. And so I trade the coat for the chicken and what this means, of course, is that there needs to be somebody on the other side of this trade, right? That is somebody who has a chicken and wants to trade that for a coat, right? That would be direct exchange. And the problem, I don't know if you've ever done this, you know, like Craigslist, for example, has a, has a barter section. Uh, it's horribly, horribly inconvenient, right? It's inconvenient because you have to find the person who has what you want and wants what you have, that person might not even exist, right? Like, the, out of all of the people who have chickens, how many of them want a coat? I mean, isn't it probably likely to be only a fraction of it? It's not all of them, right? Like, uh, you, you're really cutting down the the ability here of uh, uh, to trade, right? It's, it's very inconvenient, okay? So what we find is that direct exchange is very, very rare, right? I mean, even historically, we actually have no historical examples uh, of any civilization engaging in really much barter at all, right? Economists used to think that that was the predecessor of the use of money, and maybe it was, but like I said, money has been used for so long historically, it goes way back into prehistory. So we actually have no record of any, any society using barter at all. But we know that sometimes it takes place. It usually takes place when the regular exchange mechanism, the regular markets have broken down, okay? So let's just go on and we'll define what's called indirect exchange. And this is, this is what we almost always do, okay? When we use markets, we are, we are doing indirect exchange, okay? So... Indirect exchange, we could just say, this is a typical market using money. And this is what makes money so much more convenient, right? So rather than taking our coat, which we, we you know, we want to ultimately have a chicken at the end of this, right? We, we take the coat and we sell it for money, right? 
Then we take the money and we use that to buy the chicken that we want, right? Now, this seems like more inconvenient because it's less direct, right? We're doing two trades rather than one. Why don't we just go directly to the place we want to go, right? Well, the it's actually far, far more convenient, of course, right? Because the person on the other end of this trade does not need to be locked into this exact same thing, right? By selling their chicken for money, right, they can then buy with that money anything they want, right? That's... That's much easier, right? Now all we need to do is find a chicken that is for sale. That's all, right? We don't need to know what is the person going to then do with that money. and It doesn't matter, right? The, much, much easier, okay? So the more convenient, and this is where we get this term, uh, the medium of exchange, right? The, the facilitator of exchange. I think that which makes exchange, which makes trade much, much easier, okay? So by facilitating indirect exchange. All right. Um, now, this is going to be made easier if money has a couple of qualities, right, which uh, which will come into play in a minute. All right, let me, let me go through all this, uh, and then we'll talk about that. All right, our, our second uh, economic function of money uh, is the unit of account. Okay, the unit of account, uh, sometimes called the measure of value, the measure of value of things. Okay, so what this means is, and it follows very much from the first uh, function of money, okay, the, the means of payment, the, the medium of exchange. What this means is, if this commodity has become widely accepted as the means of payment, well, now it becomes the unit by which all other things are judged, right? The, the measure of value or the unit of value, okay? So we could talk for a moment about um, our own uh, unit of value, right? That is uh, the dollar. Let's take this for example, okay? So the United States, right, uses this, uh, this word, the dollar. Uh, that's an interesting one because the word itself has been severed from its historical meaning, right? Dollar doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't convey anything. It doesn't connote anything, right? Um, the word probably comes from uh, uh, Joaquin's Thaler, or this, this term, okay? Uh, Thaler was the word for a one-ounce silver coin, okay, from this region, right? So Thaler, etymologically, probably Thaler turned into dollar. You know, it's kind of similar as a word, right? That's, that's probably what the, what the etymology is, okay? Um, so, but currently, right, our unit of account has been very much severed from any particular history, right? But what this means, the unit of account, is the way we think about the value of other things it has to be in terms of something, right? So it becomes in terms of that that good that it's traded for, okay? So example, let's say that cattle is money, right? A uh, head of cattle is used as money. Well, then every, every price in a society takes place in the form of cattle, right? You'd say, well, what does it cost to buy a house, right? So the price of all these things, right? Let's say a house, all right? What's a house? All right, that's 10 cattle, all right? Um, what about, um, you know, what about hiring somebody uh, to do something for you? Uh, so, well, okay, that's, let's say, two weeks of a person's labor, all right? Well, maybe that's one cattle, right? Et cetera, right? Every price in the society is going to be in terms of that which is used as money, right? That's, and you can see how this follows very directly from the universal exchangeability or the widespread acceptance of the good uh, in terms of the means of payment, okay? So what, what works best here is since we're talking about units, right? And since then, this becomes the measure of value, right? That is, it becomes a quantity measure, quantity of value. The best here 
would be as if we were dealing with a very standardized commodity, okay? A commodity which was very, very uniform, okay? Always the same, right? And we can see that cattle is actually not ideal for this, right? Because one cattle, a I mean, head of cattle might not be the same as the other, right? I, I mean, you know, weak, sickly animal is different from a big, strong one, right? Or a big, fat one or whatever, right? This is, the cattle is not at all standard, is the, is the problem with it, right? So if we're going to use that as the unit, that's not a good unit, right? Like, like units of distance that are based on the human body, okay? So we have, for example, a very old measure of distance, which is the cubit, right? That's the, the distance uh, from here to here, okay? So the cubit is not a great measure of distance because, you know, it varies depending on the person, right? It actually doesn't vary as much as you might think, but it, it still, it varies, right? People's, even the length of their, their limbs are different, right? So for the unit of account, the best that's going to serve that, the, what's going to serve that function the best is something which is standardized, okay? And again, this is where the monetary metals uh, fulfill this role very, very well, right? The monetary metals, these can be highly standardized, and what happens historically is that they are highly standardized, okay? So if we take a gold, for example, gold is the undisputed king of commodity money, right? Like if we had to think of, if you just put an image in your mind, you said like, okay, here's here's money, what does it look like, right? Um, here's a here's a treasure trove or whatever, what are, you, what are you visualizing? You probably are thinking of something that involves gold, right? I mean, because it's a very long history of societies uh, all over the world using gold, all right? So, and gold has this property. It can be highly standardized, right? Gold that is, is historically that is used as a monetary metal is held to a certain purity, a certain fineness, okay? Uh, so the unit of account, all right? And finally, the third economic function of money is that m money is a store of value. All right, a store of value. So that is a way of storing wealth, okay? It allows you to store wealth, all right? And something which allows you to store wealth, what you'd like is you'd like that thing to be durable, right? To, to last over time, to be, to be non-perishable, right? So... It's a little strange that some of our examples of money are things that actually are perishable. You know, we spices and salt and even things like tobacco. Tobacco, you know, this could last a long time as long as it's kept dry. But, you know, these are things that ultimately are perishable, right? Ideally, you'd like something which is the opposite of that, right? Non-perishable. And again, the monetary metals excel at this, right? Gold is a remarkably durable, durable metal, given that it's relatively soft, right? That is, it's very stable in and of itself, right? We, so gold that's thousands of years old is still good, right? Nothing has, nothing bad has happened to it, right? Gold can even be under the ocean for hundreds of years, right? And still be good, right? There are people who, who do nothing but try and find old shipwrecks, uh, hoping that they'll find gold on it, right? because it can be underwater, even under salt water. It, it, that's not the case with other metals, right? That's not the case with the ferrous metals and so on, right? Like iron will corrode, uh, it will rust, uh, but not gold and not silver, right? So for, for these reasons, right? Because the monetary metals fulfill these functions better than other things, they begin to edge out the, the other commodities, okay? But what we often find historically is that several commodities uh, may serve as money in the same market. Okay, several commodities may serve as money in the same market, and that means you'd have different prices in each of these different markets. Okay, so example, we go back in time to uh, colonial New England Right, this is New England uh, in, in the colonial period, um, you know, before the Declaration of Independence and all of this. Um, in colonial New England, you had markets which used several different commodities. Okay, so they used uh, 
furs, pelts. Uh, they also used gold and silver. And they also traded in tobacco. All right, so using these using these different commodities, you know, it's the same market uh, or in, in related markets at the same time, all right? So this means that there's going to be a price in each one of these, right? Like there's going to be a furs price, there's going to be a gold price, there's going to be a silver price, there's going to be a tobacco price, okay? So there'll be a different set of prices depending on what kind of money that, that you're using, all right? And, you know, this gives rise to a kind of historical curiosity, right? Because gold, gold is like, like I said, the king of commodity money and silver is like the queen, right? That, you know, the, these are very widely used metals, okay? So there is a historical ratio between gold and silver, okay? The, the gold to silver ratio, okay? And we have, we have many years of historical data on this, okay? Um, and the gold-silver ratio, just, just FYI, um, is about like this, right? Like one, one piece of gold historically buys about 40 pieces of silver of the same weight, all right? So, you know, that's just a kind of historical baseline, all right? Um, so commodities, different kinds of commodity money may be used. That means there's going to be several different prices. That in, it, in and of itself is not a problem, right? Markets will adjust these prices, right? Like this ratio may rise or fall, right? According to the supply and demand for each one of these things, right? Like if, gold, if furs become more valuable, well, we would expect the, the, that to be reflected in these other prices, right? That is a fur, if it's more valuable now, will buy more gold than before, more tobacco than before and so on. Next topic is we have to explore what is the value of money in the commodity money system, okay? Where does the value, what is the value, what determines it, right? Um, what determines the value of money, All right? And it has a very simple answer to it, okay? The value of money is equal to the value of the commodity, right? You know, what gives money its value? Uh, that's a dumb question, right? Under the commodity money era, it's a dumb question. No, nobody's going to ask that question. Why does, why, why does, why is this head of cattle? Why does it buy other things? Um, well, the very simple answer to that is well, because it's useful. You know, it, it, um, you know. Okay, so if we talk about what what drives the value of the commodity. Well, it has certain useful properties, okay? It has useful properties, whatever these are, right? Depends on the commodity, right? Like cattle, well, you can eat that. Uh, you know, the cow can do work for you. Uh, you know, you can make leather out of the hide. You can, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of the, all of the useful properties that, uh, that this has, right? And also, there's a cost to producing it, okay? So there is a cost of production. So these are the twin reasons why any commodity has value, right? So, and we could summarize this uh, in terms of words that you probably heard before, demand and supply, all right? So the value of the commodity is driven by its supply and demand, and that is equal to the, the value of money, okay? so. Let's draw a graph of this, just so that we can try to understand this a little more, a little more clearly. Okay, so on this axis, we're going to put the value of money, okay? That is the value of the commodity that's used as money, okay? So in this example, let's say that it is gold uh, that is being used as money, right? Again, historically very prevalent. Okay, so we have the value right up here. You know, we, we've been used to putting this in terms of price, right? Uh, and then down here, we're going to have the quantity. Okay, so the quantity of gold. And let's say that that represents a number of ounces uh, of gold. Now, by the way, gold has its own ounce system. Um, it's called the, the troy ounce. 
right? So as if things weren't already confusing enough with regard to ounces and whatever, this is actually a different ounce, slightly different than the ounce that's used, you know, in the, the um, Imperial British system of measure that, of course, the Brits don't even use anymore, uh, but the Americans still use it, right? So anyway, this doesn't matter all that much, right? We're just talking about this is the number of, of ounces, okay? So we start at zero, right, and, and increase going this direction, and this represents the value, okay? Now, if a commodity is used as money, we have a little bit of an issue trying to describe its value, okay? We have to describe its value in terms of something else, okay? Because gold itself is the numeraire, right? It's the, it's the thing which every other unit um, uses, right? It's a little bit like saying, uh, what is a dollar worth? And the answer is it's worth a dollar, right? That doesn't tell you anything. That's a tautology. That, that, that's just a circle that goes around endlessly, right? Like, what's an ounce of gold worth? Well, it's worth one ounce of gold, right? Well, that's not really that helpful, right? We have to express it in terms of its buying power. That is, what does it buy? Okay, so let's express the value in terms of something else. Okay, let's say the number of cattle per ounce of gold, okay? Number of cattle per ounce. Okay, why did I choose cattle? You know, you got to choose something, right? I just chose it because, you know, again, it's a, a common uh, common form of livestock many societies use, okay? So we have to choose some other commodity. How? What is its buying power, okay? So what this would mean is if one ounce, let's say, Let's say it's at one, right? So if, if one ounce buys you one head of cattle, okay, that's a certain value, right? Versus if it buys you two, okay, well, that actually buys more, right? So the value is higher if it buys you two head of cattle, assuming that cattle are standardized and whatever, which we know they're not. But let's just assume that we're talking about the average cattle, okay? So... One versus two, right? Two would express a higher value, okay? All right, so gold is, uh, the value of it, right, as money, is driven by two things, okay? The, the demand, on the one hand, and the supply, on the other hand, all right? So, as I've said, the supply has to do, it's driven by the cost of production of the gold, okay? So we would ask the question here, how much uh, labor is embodied in gold in the whole process, right? You gotta, you gotta find it, right? You have to, and then you have, once you found it, gold is generally speaking mixed with other things, right? You have to refine it, you have to separate the the rock that it's in, you have to get rid of the other stuff, you have to refine it, okay? So how much labor to find, to mine, and to refine the gold, right? Labor in all of its different forms, right? As equipment, as raw materials, etc., 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 right? That's, all of this goes into determining the supply of gold, okay? I mean, we could even talk about just how much gold is even available on the planet Earth, right? That's a kind of ultimate limiting factor, all right? Um, and the demand, when we talk about a commodity being used as money, demand then has two components, okay? So the first one has to do with the useful properties uh, of gold, all right? So uh, what's known as the use value, okay? The, the um, you know, what, what uh, Smith and Ricardo uh, described as the use value of something. So the use value means what is what are its useful properties? What can it be used for? All right. And the main use of gold is for jewelry. All right. So for for ornamentation, decoration. It's a decorative metal. Okay. Um, later on, in terms of uh, history, we, it finds a use in things like electronics. Um, because gold uh, is an excellent conductor, right? It's an excellent conductor of both heat and electricity. So 
These are some of gold's useful properties, right? We find it beautiful and also excellent conductor, okay? Now, there's a secondary portion here, a secondary cause of demand, which is known as the demand for money, okay? So the pure money demand. Um, I know this sounds a little bit strange, like the demand for money. Yeah, duh, right? Oh, don't we all want money? We want more of it? Well, it's like, uh, yeah, but, okay, the, what this means is uh, to make trades, right? So if gold is being used as money and you want to engage in trade, well, then there's a certain amount of money which is needed just to make trades, right? We're not talking about spending it. We're talking about to buy and sell things, right? Gold is the medium of exchange in this, in this example, right? So the greater the demand for money, because, you know, this is based on the, the volume of trade, okay? How much trade is taking place in a society, all right? So two different kinds of reasons why there's demand for money, okay? One based on the properties of the thing itself, and the other one is a, a more of an abstract thing, okay? The economic demand for money. All right, we, we bring these two together, and where supply equals demand, this is where the value of money is going to be determined, okay? So, and let's say that it's one, right? So, what this means, again, let me just expand on this. This means one ounce of gold has a buying power. It buys one head of cattle, okay? So, the value of money is determined by, driven by, it's equal to the, the value of the commodity, which is driven by the supply and the demand, all right? Now, this can change, okay? So the shifts in supply and demand, shifts in supply and demand would lead to changes in the value of money. All right, this is what uh, Ricardo pointed out, okay, the classical economist, David Ricardo. Ricardo said, look, the gold is used as a standard of value, but it is not itself standard, right? It's not, the way Ricardo expressed it was, what we would like to have is an invariable standard of value. But, you know, Ricardo said, look, the only problem is nothing is an invariable standard of value doesn't actually exist, you know. Gold changes in value according to shifts in supply and demand. All right, let me give you two historical examples. Okay, so headline, the value of money. We can get changes in the value of money driven by changes in supply or changes in demand, all right? Um, and changes in the value of money are going to represent inflation or deflation, right? Inflation or deflation. So, example, okay, let's talk about a historical example. So, this one has to do with the discovery of the new world, right? Discovery of the new world uh, by Europeans, obviously, the people who were living in, in the uh, uh, area later become known as the Caribbean and the uh, Americas. They knew about it, obviously, right? Um, the native people knew about it. But it was discovered by Europeans. Um, and, you know, historically, the first thing that the Europeans did was uh, take slaves, right, enslave the native people. And, uh, and they found out that there was gold and silver in the Americas. Um, so... Discovery of the New World was a tremendous source of new gold, right? So capturing people, uh, conquering entire regions, and then stealing the gold and bringing it back to Europe. Okay, so what did this do? Well, this caused a shift in the supply, okay? So we go from gold at an initial position, S1, to S2, okay? So the supply curve shifts to the right. Now let's assume that the demand curve did not also shift during this period, all right? So in terms of the gold market, 
Okay, so again, up here, we've got the value. Down here, we have the quantity. Okay, so we, we move from our initial position at point A to a new equilibrium position at point B. And what happens here is that the value falls. Okay, so let's say that initially the value, okay, let's go like this. Right? So again, we have to say value in terms of something else, right? So let's stick with our same thing that we've been using, okay? That is the number of cattle that can be bought per ounce of gold, okay? So uh, as the supply curve shifts to the right, right, that is the new gold that enters the European market means there's a greater supply of the stuff, right? And what happens then? The value per unit of gold declines, okay? And this is historically accurate, more or less, right? Adam Smith says this, the, the value of gold falls by about a third, okay? So going from about three to two. Uh, and what this represents is a decrease in the value of money, right? Gold is used as money. Gold has just gone down in value, right? And a decrease in the value of money is inflation, okay? So just, just to make sure that we understand this, right? Let's, let's sketch this out, okay? So remember, the number of cattle per ounce of gold, okay? So before, this is what happened, right? You had your one ounce gold coin and you showed up at the market you said, I am buying some cattle, okay? How much can I get for my one ounce gold? And they said, you can get three cattle, right? Three head of cattle. Wow, fantastic. All right, look, uh, bring them over here. Okay, that's all I got. I got them. But now the new reality is that this only buys two, right? It buys less than before, okay? So if you wanted three, you would have to spend more than you did before. Right now, it would cost you uh, one and a third ounces of gold, right? Uh, uh, that is, or I'm sorry, one and a half, right? So what? It, so to, to put this in other terms, right? If you, if you still wanted three cattle, this is now gonna cost you 1.5 ounces of gold, right? So we can see what has happened is the price of cattle in terms of gold has increased, okay? And this is this is ceteris paribus, right? Assuming that nothing else has changed, right? One ounce buys you two rather than three. That is, if you wanted three, it now is gonna cost you 1.5 ounces rather than, um, rather than just one as it did in the past, all right? So the price level has gone up. That's what inflation is. Price level on average has increased. Okay, so that could happen, right? The value of money could go down. But, you know, here's the thing, right? Even though we have a prominent historical example of this, right? The New World uh, is discovered right at the end of the 15th century, at the end of the 1400s. So this is, this is happening uh, in the 1500s, right? That's when the European, uh, you know, conquistadors and so on the conquest of the new world and the, and the grabbing of this gold and so forth. That's when this occurs historically, okay? So there's really only one historical example of this, right? We don't actually have, beyond that, we don't really have very many historical examples. So even though it is true, right, that, that an in, a rapid increase in the supply of gold is gonna push down its value, causing inflation, okay, there's, there's really only one historical example, all right? Only one historical example uh, of an increase in supply of gold uh, causing inflation, okay? The reality is that the value of gold uh, has remained remarkably stable remarkably stable over time, okay? So why is that? I mean, 
we have to explore it, right? Um, but so I, I don't want you guys to get the wrong idea, right? We we have it is the case that shifts in supply can cause changes in the in the value of the commodity, which then change the value of money, right? But that's not actually the historical experience, right? Apart from this one example that I mentioned. Okay. All right. So second example is that if we have an increase in demand for gold, um, this is also gonna, going to shift uh, the value. All right, so again, we draw a graph here. We got the, the quantity, we got the value, okay, the number of cattle per ounce. Okay, again, we're talking about uh, the gold market. But what's happening now is the demand is increasing okay so we go from d1 to d2 we've got a shift to the right okay we're moving along an existing supply curve and what might cause this this shift okay well you know all of the things that give rise so so an increase in demand for gold let's say that this is caused by an increase in the volume of trade, right? That gives rise to a greater demand for money, okay? Demand for money it is enhanced. Perhaps there's greater population. Greater population leads to greater demand for all kinds of things and, and so on. Okay, so but what would this mean? Well, we'd shift from equilibrium point A to equilibrium Point B, okay. So the quantity uh, would increase, and the value would increase, right? The value would increase. So we'd go from, let's say, we'd go from one uh, to one point two. Okay. So all of this increase in the value of gold, and what that is is deflation. Okay, that is decrease in the price level, right? So just to make it clear, right, the increase in the value means an increase in the buying power. Okay, the buying power of money increases and that's, that's deflation, right? That is a falling price level. Okay, so let's say that, you know, before... Let's multiply all this by 10, okay? Let's say, what would 10 ounces of gold buy you? I have 10 gold coins, my good man. I'm coming to you, your cattle broker. What can you do for me? Okay, so in the past, what this meant was, you know, one ounce would buy you one head of cattle, right? So 10 ounces would buy you 10 head of cattle, right? So, but now, oh, look at this. They go further. Now, fantastic, look at this. My 10 ounces of gold will now buy me 12 cattle, right? Because it's 1.2 now per ounce, okay? So, fabulous, right? That means each ounce of gold goes further than before, right? Um, so, that is a falling price level. That is deflation, okay? So, changes in the price level occur due to shifts in supply and demand. I think what has happened historically with the gold market and one reason why it has remained stable is that if both curves shift, we get we get a pretty stable value. Okay, so example, both supply and demand shift, the value uh, may remain uh, either totally stable or simply more stable uh, than what it had been in before. Okay, so example of this occurring. Okay, so we've got the value. Again, we're talking about the gold market. We've got the quantity. Um, so let's say that our initial supply curve is here. Uh, we get a new supply curve here, right? And our initial demand curve is here. And we have a new demand curve here. Okay, so 
Now, if both curves shift, this is a little bit less convenient for us for analytical purposes because it's harder for us to tell what exactly is happening, right? It depends on this, the strength of these shifts. You have two forces fighting each other now, right? Because the supply shift is going to, other things being equal, tend to push down the value, right? But the demand curve shift is other things being equal, tending to push up the value. So the question is, which one's going to win, right? And maybe they end up kind of on, on the level with one another, right? That is, we move from the old equilibrium, point A, to the new equilibrium, and the value is unchanged, okay, perhaps, right? So we, we have, there is more gold, but because there's both a greater supply and a greater demand, it hasn't really shifted the value at all, okay? And this, this may have been uh, historically, right? So again, we have a kind of historical reality uh, is that the value of gold is fairly stable. Um, it doesn't mean there are no fluctuations. It just means it's, it's fairly stable. I mean, especially when we, we consider, wow, we have thousands of years of data. Uh, I mean, not great data, but you know, the further we go back, the worse our data is, right? But we have... We have a lot of information about gold, uh, what, what gold will buy, right? We have, you know, ancient Roman records of, you know, what did a, um, what did a suit of fine clothing cost in ancient Rome, right? So, you know, we, this, is, this is where we get the idea that the value of gold is fairly stable historically, okay? That's not an ironclad law. It's not saying it has to be that way. It's just saying, you know, that's been the reality. And probably it's because these supply and demand curve shifts that have occurred have tended to be of relatively equal magnitude, right? The, the supply curve shifts that happen on a on a year-to-year -year basis are because of decreases in the cost of production, right? That is new technology, increases in productivity, better mining, better refining, etc., right? These technological advances have been occurring, you know, in the way that these things do, right? That is slightly pushing down the cost per unit or slightly increasing the productivity and so forth, right? So that has been occurring. Meanwhile, the demand for gold has also increased, right, for similar reasons, okay? That is, the, the, um, there's the population... Uh, is wealthier than before, there's more people, etc. Okay, so supply and demand curve shifts have remained relatively equal historically for gold, with a few historical exceptions. Okay, so in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the development of paper money. That's our second uh, historical epic of money. Uh, but that's it for my lecture for today. Thank you very much.